Thanks, Dr. Saad, for this nice introduction and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to join the MEGA uh, Learning uh, Engage and Connect. Um, and uh, we uh, tonight we have, or today in Canada, still daytime, isn't it? Uh, daytime, Hamad? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to welcome um, Muhammad and uh, Sharif will join us later on also from Toronto. Uh, Muhammad will uh, speak to us tonight about uh, sleep medicine and anesthesia. Uh, Muhammad background, Muhammad Salah background, he was graduated from uh, Ain Shams University and um, finished his uh, uh, MD degree there and he had his initial uh, training in Ain Shams University. He's a lecturer of anesthesia in Ain Shams University and he uh, traveled to Canada where he finished one of his clinical fellowships in echocardiography and then he is now a clinical fellow in uh, sleep medicine and anesthesia and pain. Uh, welcome, Mohammed. How is weather in Canada? <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's it's getting uh, cold, like we're getting into autumn now. Uh, nice. But it's it's still nice. We still don't have the snow. Uh, yeah. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Omar, for this nice uh, presentation, and thank you, Dr. Saad, for uh, allowing me to be a part of uh, this uh, big project. Uh, you're doing here so uh, so thank you everyone I would like to just thank everybody for having uh, me today with you here in a mega online learning platform uh, I was really honored and uh, thrilled by Dr. Saad's uh, invitation to be amongst this group here and I'm really excited to be here um, so today uh, I'll be talking about sleep medicine and anesthesia or uh, sleep medicine in the perioperative setting uh, this topic is a really an interesting one, and it's one of the new topics in anesthesia, and it has been evolving uh, through the last uh, two decades, uh, especially in North America. Uh, so through this lecture, I'll try to uh, talk about the background of sleep medicine and what's the definition of sleep. Uh, I'll talk about the sleep health and other sleep disorders. Uh, I'll try to give a brief introduction about sleep studies, and then we'll be talking about sleep and anesthesia and the relationship between sleep medicine and anesthesia. I'll, I'll be main, mainly talking about insomnia and how it's affecting pain and uh, sleep disordered breathing. So uh, as a background, so sleep is defined as a, a state of decreased arousal. Uh, that is actively generated uh, by the brain and it's crucial for the maintenance of health. And humans spend around uh, one third of their lives sleeping. And sleep is usually under the control of two process, uh, process C, which is a circadian rhythm that regulates the appropriate time of sleep within the 24 hours, and process uh, S, which is a homeostatic drive that regulates sleep uh, in relation to staying awake by the sleep deprivation would be uh, leading to increased uh, sleepness. Um, and so the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has classified wakefulness and sleep into various stages based on the uh, EEG uh, patterns. So we have the wakefulness uh, or uh, stage uh, W, uh, which is mainly uh, characterized by the beta activity, which is basically high frequency, uh, low amplitude EEG waves. Then we have the non-REM sleep, which is further uh, divided into three stages. Stage, uh, then we have the sleep and the non-REM sleep, which is divided into three stages. We have uh, stage N1 sleep, two, uh, N2 sleep, and N3 sleep. Well, and by going further into deeper stages of sleep, the EEG waves would tend to decrease in their frequency and increase in, uh, in amplitude till we get into, as you see here, um, the slow wave sleep, uh, sleep in uh, stage N3, which is mainly basically formed of delta waves, which are low frequency and high amplitude waves. And we have the stage R for uh, REM sleep. So as you see here, uh, the EEG waves for different stages of sleep and uh, wakefulness. And as you notice, uh, the stage three non-REM sleep, which is a slow wave sleep with delta waves is similar to those that we see in patients under deep surgical anesthesia, uh, as you can see here. 
Uh, so now let's talk about type of sleep studies. So we have two major types of sleep studies. Uh, we have the daytime sleep study or the what we call the multiple sleep latency testing uh, or MSLT, which we usually do to test for narcolepsy or excessive daytime sleepness. And then we have the nighttime sleep studies, which can be further divided into four different types or four levels, as you can see here. So we have the level, the uh, well-known level one or in-lab sleep studies, which usually would be with a, a sleep technician attending and it, ha it would have a minimum of seven channels as per uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine criteria. And it can be diagnostic or uh, as it's, uh, a sleep technologist would be attending these sleep studies. So it can be done as a therapeutic or uh, a diagnostic sleep study. Then we have the level, level two sleep studies, which is the same as level one, but it's usually unattended polysomnography uh, and it would have a seven channels as well. Um, then we have the portable sleep studies, which are level three or level four. So portable uh, level three usually have three to four uh, channels as per American Academy of Sleep uh, Medicine and level four would only be one uh, channel. Uh, so as you see here, uh, this is the in lab or level one sleep studies. And these are, uh, this is a portable or level three uh, sleep study. So as you see here in, in, in uh, level one sleep study, usually you have a minimum of seven channels. As you see here, you will have EEG, um, EOG, and also you'll have uh, EMG for the chin or legs. And also you'll have a uh, thoracic uh, movement and abdominal movement, as well as uh, airflow uh, channels to measure the airflow during sleep. And um, you'll also have the pulse oximeter and body position. Well, as you see here in portable uh, or level three sleep studies, uh, these are portable sleep studies that can be done easily at home. Uh, and it was like uh, during COVID times, we were using these sleep study uh, frequently here in Canada. Uh, because, you know, like it was difficult to send patients to do uh, in-lab st uh, sleep study during the COVID times. So uh, it's, it's very easy and very simple and can be done by the patient at home um, where it can measure uh, the airflow. It would have like a minimum of four, uh, three to four channels, uh, one channel for airflow and one for pulse oximeter, as you see here, and one for thoracic uh, or uh, chest wall movements and one for body position. Um, and uh, as you see here, uh, I, I was trying to show you how a sleep study or how the raw data for sleep study looks like. So this is like a level one sleep study, as you see here. So we have the EEG uh, data, the electrooculography data, the EMG data, and as well, we'll have the EEG, uh, ECG uh, as well here, um, oxygen saturation, airflow, uh, and thoracic and abdominal movements. And in the level three, we'll only have the sat saturation, information about the saturations, the thoracic and airflow movement uh, and body position as you see here. Uh, so, and in level one, so as I told you, you we have the EEG, e, uh, EOG, uh, EMG, and by these, we can get um, the different stages, as you see here, the different stages of sleep. And we can see how the patient is moving from one stage to a different stage uh, by starting by being awake, then getting into the non-REM sleep stage N1, N2, and then N3, which is the deeper stages of sleep, and waking up going uh, back and forth in different stages until patient would reach the uh, REM sleep. Uh, and these are some nomenclatures that we use and how events are being recorded during a sleep study. So um, we have, there's a big difference that, that can confuse everybody between what we call a total uh, recording time or total bedtime and total sleep time. So usually the total recording time would be the time from starting the recording, from turning the lights off and turning it back on. And the total sleep uh, time would be the time that the patient would be actually spending during, uh, in sleep. Uh, and we use both these times to calculate what we call a sleep latency, which is a time 
from starting the recording into the, getting the patient to sleep, which can be for sure increased in patients who's having uh, initiation insomnia. And uh, we also would have, uh, would use it to calculate what we call sleep efficiency, which we use to um, diagnose or determine if the patient is having some kind of insomnia or not. Uh, then we have the sleep latency, or uh, and we have also the REM latency, which is a time taken from patient starting to sleep into getting into the first REM cycle. Then we have what we call wakefulness after sleep onset, and uh, as as for sure everybody would know, we also uh, would calculate the ab uh, apnea hypopnea index or AHI, respiratory disturbance and uh, index uh, ODI and oxygen nadir and T90. So T90 is the time which is um, spent or percentage of time of total sleep time, which is spent uh, with a patient saturation below 90%. And we use it. It's a very prognostic, very important in determining uh, how uh, severe uh, the sleep apnea is. Sorry. Uh, so, so when to do a sleep study? So usually we do a sleep study. There are some symptoms that can be uh, that can uh, let us suspect that the patient might have a sleep problem. This, uh, for example, increased daytime sleepness or persistent fatigue or what we call non-restorative sleep, uh, uh, despite of the patient getting a, a good or enough time of sleep during the night. Uh, transportation accidents, for sure. Uh, sleep disorder breathing, uh, like snoring or uh, apnea, uh, nocturia or increase the time uh, going to the washroom uh, at night, which is a very important symptom or a very important, uh, like it's very common in patients who are having sleep apnea, uh, uh, periodic leg movements, morning headache and dry mouth. Again, it's a very uh, important symptom of uh, patients who have, uh, might have sleep apnea, parasomnia behavior, uh, nighttime and night terrors. Um, so definitely when we talk about the cost benefit uh, value, uh, for sure we need to know that uh, diagnosis of some sleep disorders such as OSA in perioperative period does really worth it. Um, as, as you know, like uh, OSA related perioperative complications have been well documented, which lead to increased resource uh, utilization and uh, healthcare cost as well as malpractice lawsuits. Um, so uh, now I'll try to speak about the sleep health. So for sleep health, we have a five important pillars for sleep health that determine the sleep health. Uh, these pillars are the sleep quality, which is a subjective assessment of good or, uh, good or poor sleep, just by asking, simply asking the patient, are you satisfied by your sleep or not? Um, we have also the sleep timing, which is a placement of the sleep within the 24 hours. Um, and we have the sleep duration, which is the total amount of sleep per 24 hours. Alertness and the sleep efficiency, which is the ease of falling asleep and returning back to sleep. Uh, and then when we talk about sleep disorders, so uh, these are the most important sleep disorders that we have. So for sure, we all know about the sleep disorder breathing. Uh, such as uh, central and obstructive sleep apneas, so sleep movement disorders like uh, restless leg syndrome and periodic leg movements, parasomnia behaviors uh, like uh, sleepwalking, talking, or uh, night terrors, insomnia, uh, narcolepsy, which is excessive daytime sleepness, and circadian rhythm disorders. Um, so... Uh, by talking about sleep medicine and anesthesia, we, we really should know that sleep disorders affect up to 25% of general population and can reach up to high to 80% uh, in high risk populations right, uh, like uh, bariatric patients. And these patients uh, are associated with an increased risk of adverse perioperative events. And uh, Despite all that, uh, still the key sleep medicine topics that are most important for the practice of anesthesia have not uh, been well defined. Uh, but so the importance of integrating sleep knowledge into the anesthesia curriculum and practice has been uh, expanding lately. Um, and so uh, in this study, uh, this was like a framework uh, of how to integrate sleep medicine into the anesthesia training. 
Uh, it was proposed in this study by uh, Dr. Singh, who's the director of sleep medicine in anesthesia. And as you see here uh, at University of Toronto, so uh, as you see here, um, he was uh, proposing that uh, it's very important for anesthetists to understand how the sleep physiology is and how to evaluate sleep health and how to evaluate the sleep disorders, uh, as well as taking role in professional and academic roles in perioperative uh, settings and uh, sleep medicine setting, and how it's important to know how uh, sleep is very important for physician wellness. Um, and as I said, we're trying to do this by uh, through two settings, a perioperative setting by perioperative clinic and how to diagnose and screen for sleep disorders and how sleep can be affecting really acute and chronic pain as well as transitional pain. And also through sleep medicine settings through sleep clinic and sleep lab rotations. Um, and so this was also a, a study done that reminds a high priority uh, sleep medicine topics, as you see here, um, that should be included in uh, the education of anesthesia residents, uh, based on uh, the insights of experts in the fields of anesthesia and sleep medicine. And they just did like a cross-sectional survey. And so they find that um, uh, topics that should be included in anesthesia training based on an expert consensus, 100% agreement were for sure effects of sleep and anesthesia on upper airway patency, uh, influence of opioids and anesthetic on control of breathing and upper way obstruction, um, anesthetic management of patients with sleep apnea, and for sure the potential interactions between wake promoting and hypnotic medications and anesthetic with anesthetic agents. Um, so talking about insomnia, there's a, we, uh, when we talk about insomnia, uh, we should mention that there is a high prevalence of insomnia for sure in general populations that for sure will increase with the stress of surgery in the perioperative setting. So uh, for insomnia, it can be for sure chronic or short-term insomnia according to its, uh, its duration. And insomnia can be further classified into sleep initiation insomnia, which is difficulty falling asleep or sleep maintenance insomnia which is difficulty to stay asleep or both uh, sleep initiation and sleep maintenance insomnia um, and for sure when we uh, talk about uh, insomnia for sure we need to outline the strong relationship between insomnia and pain which is a bi-directional relationship as we see here so pain can really affect sleep by causing insomnia and affect your sleep health and in the meantime, uh, insomnia uh, would, uh, can really affect pain by increasing the pain sensitivity and prolonging the, prolonging the duration of pain. And many studies have shown that um, patients with insomnia, their uh, perioperative or postoperative pain is more likely to persist and uh, develop into chronic pain and their opioids need in the perioperative setting would be higher than other patients who are not having insomnia. Um, then uh, now we'll be talking about sleep disordered breathing, which is, as you know, sleep disordered, it's, it's, it's like a spectrum of disorders, as you see here, uh, with abnormal uh, breathing patterns during sleep. Uh, the mildest of them is the respiratory effort arousals or snoring, and the most severe of them is uh, hypopnea and apnea uh, with abnormal uh, gas exchange. Um, so to define an event of a sleep disordered breathing, um, we need to put in mind uh, the duration, the amplitude, and the consequence. So uh, for for duration, uh, for a sleep for a sleep disordered breathing event to be recorded, it should be at least of a duration more than uh, ten seconds, and the amplitude, um, how much which is how much the decrease in the airflow or the respiratory effort, which can be either uh, more than, it should be uh, at least more than 30% to say it's an hypopnic event or to say uh, it should be more than 90% equal to uh, more than 90% to say that it was an abnic event. And the uh, consequence that would happen, which would be either desaturation or uh, arousal. So as we mentioned before, so for an event to be considered as an abnic event, 
it should be at least uh, uh, for uh, lasting for 10 seconds. And as a decrease in airflow or respiratory effort should be at least more than 90% uh, from the baseline. But for an apneic event to be recorded, if it's satisfied, if it's uh, more than 10 seconds and more than 90%, we don't need any uh, consequence to record it, either uh, desaturation or arousal. Uh, and the same for hypopnea, but however, for hypopnea, in order to be recorded, it should be associated with a desat or uh, an arousal. Uh, so this is an example of a patient uh, with a obstructive apneic events, as you see here. So uh, this is the raw data for the sleep study. And as you see here in the airflow, uh, so it's considered an apnea because we don't have any airflow here. Uh, and in order to classify it, whether it's obstructive or apneic, uh, sorry, obstructive uh, apnea or central apnea, we need to see the respiratory efforts through the thoracic and abdominal channels. Uh, and as you see here, patient is still having some uh, continued or increased inspiratory effort uh, during the period of uh, absent airflow. However, and also we can see that this patient is having what we call paradoxical breathing. Uh, so usually uh, during normal respiration, uh, we'll find during the thoracic movement, upward movement of the thorax and upward movement of the abdomen, they're moving together. But during obstruction, you'll find what we call the paradoxical or opposite movement of uh, thorax and abdomen. Uh, well, as you see here in this patient who's having a central apnea, so as you see here in the air channel, airflow channel, uh, there's no airflow. And when you look at the thorax and abdomen, you'll see that there's no uh, any respiratory effort here, which is. Uh, consistent with a central sleep apnea. And also we have the kind of breathing, which is an, uh, a type of central sleep apnea where we have no airflow and we have what we call the crescendo, the crescendo uh, respiratory effort, which happens. And usually this, we find this in some patients with uh, some uh, cardiac problems and uh, CNS problems like stroke. So as you see here, a patient would be apneic, no airflow, so which would lead to hypercapnia uh, and increase the respiratory drive. So patient would be hyperventilating, then he would reach uh, a state of hypocapnia uh, where the respiratory drive would be decreasing and then patient would get into apneic attack. Then we have the mixed apnea, which is a mix, uh, mixture of uh, central and uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, as you see here, so we say this patient is having apnea because there's no airflow here. And during the first part of this apnea, patient is not doing any respiratory effort, but during the second part, patient is starting to do a respiratory effort. But here, as you see here, patient is doing some respiratory effort, but still we don't have any airflow. And as we said, for a, for a hypopnea, uh, an, an event of hypopnea to, to be recorded. It should be associated with either desaturation or a respiratory arousal. So this is a patient with, as you see here, the airflow channel. Airflow is starting to decrease, but still we have some kind of decreased airflow. And also respiratory effort is decreasing, but we still have some kind of respiratory effort. But in order to record this event, we need to have, as you see here, some desaturation or scooping of the, as you see here, some scooping of the sap, oxygen sap here. So this is an obstructive hypopnea with desaturation, or we should have uh, respiratory arousals, as you see here, so patient is breathing, some hypopneas, then a patient would get, uh, start to, uh, to wake up or get a, uh, what we call a respiratory arousals from sleep, where he start to, uh, to breathe again, and then, patient would get into hypopneas, then would wake up again and get again a respiratory arousal. Um, so to measure the uh, sleep disordered breathing uh, severity, we use the apnea hypopnea index or AHI, which is the numbers of apneas or hypopneas per hour of sleep. 
or we use the oxygen desaturation index, which is the ODI or decrease in oxygen desaturation. These are more than 3% or 4% per hour of sleep. And we have what we call the oxygen nadir or lowest oxygen saturation during the sleep time. And we have also what we call T90, which is a percentage of time spent below the saturation of 90%. Sorry? Okay. Which is the time uh, percentage of times uh, spent below saturation of 90% in a total sleep time. Uh, so, uh, so for AHI, it's used to, um, as we all know, to classify uh, apneas or uh, like a sleep apnea into mild, moderate, and severe. And oxygen adhere, it, it's, uh, it's usually used to classify the desaturation as mild desaturation or moderate or severe in patients with a sleep apnea. Uh, so when we talk about sleep apnea for obstructive sleep apnea, which as we said, episodes of air, upper airway obstruction, and as we said, to measure the severity of sleep apnea, we use the AHI, uh, which can classify it further into mild, moderate, and severe uh, by HI, so if HI is between five to 15, it's considered to be mild, 15 to 30, it's moderate, and more than 30, it's considered to be severe. Uh, so for treatment for sleep apnea, for, uh, for sure, we all know that we, uh, for treatment of sleep apnea, we use a CPAP therapy, which is uh, using the BiPAP machine or CPAP machine. Uh, also, uh, sometimes because sleep apnea is more common in the supine position, so sometimes we can use in a patient who are having sleep apnea predominantly in a supine position, we can use what we call a positional survey by trying to make the patient sleep most of the time uh, on his sides by using what we call tennis ball or uh, tennis ball or special pillows. And also we have the dental appliance, uh, which is a simple oral or dental appliance that we use that tries to uh, open the airway by bringing the jaw uh, anterior, as you see here. Um, and, and so sleep, as you know, like uh, there was a study that uh, was published in 2013, which is a rude awakening, the very operative sleep apnea epidemic, uh, which find uh, that there's a high prevalence of OSA uh, almost 25% in general population, which can reach up to uh, 80%, and that the OSA is associated with a high risk of perioperative complication, as well as the perioperative CPAP was only used in less than 20% of OSA patients. Um, and so although uh, there exists mounting evidence of increased morbidity and mortality associated with OSA, uh, a study was found, that study that was done in uh, 2012, uh, 2012, it found that only 60% uh, of anesthesiologists were able to, 60% uh, uh, of anesthesiologists and 92% of surgeons failed to identify patients with uh, undiagnosed OSA presenting to surgery. And perhaps that was due to inadequate training uh, in sleep medicine, and that up to 80% of patients with sleep apnea are undiagnosed. Uh, and as we said, uh, for sleep apnea, uh, it's a very important and it's a very uh, high risk condition as OSA is increased with a uh, risk of perioperative complications, uh, as shown in many studies. Uh, such as uh, cardiopulmonary complications, cerebrovascular accident, ICU transfers, and deaths. And as we mentioned before, that more than 80% of patients with sleep apnea are undiagnosed. And for sure, undiagnosed OSA was found in many studies to have an increased risk of uh, 30 days postoperative complications. And uh, for sure, uh, many studies have shown that patients with OSA have a high risk for difficult intubation. And there was a study that showed that 53% of patients with difficult airway were having OSA with AHI more than 10. And another study that showed that 66% uh, of patients with difficult airway were shown to have OSA. Um, and so, uh, so uh, as you see here, how uh, sleep apnea is very important 
and diagnosis and screening for sleep apnea in preoperative setting is very important. So uh, one of uh, the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine great successes in the last five decades, uh, five years, sorry, uh, was the development and publication of highly cited consensus uh, guidelines for OSA. Uh, the first one was in, was in 2016, as you see here, which was for the preoperative assessment and screening for patients uh, with OSA. And uh, so it was trying to divide patients into three, uh, three main uh, categories. One is a uh, patient diagnosed with OSA who are adherent to treatment, and one is uh, a patient who's diagnosed with OSA who are not adherent to treatment. And the third one was uh, patients who are not known to be uh, having a sleep apnea, but was a high risk for sleep apnea. So for patients who are diagnosed with sleep apnea, uh, they recommended that both patient and uh, the family and team members involved in the care of the patient should know that these patients are a high risk for perioperative complications and that these patients should uh, can proceed to surgery with no further uh, investigations or uh, no further um, uh, uh, investigations unless these patients are having a high risk or having any symptoms of cardiopulmonary compromise and they should try to use their CPAP machine whenever it's possible in the perioperative setting. Uh, while patients who are uh, not known to be having the sleep apnea but are high risk for sleep apnea, these patients should be treated as if they have sleep apnea. But however, uh, and we should not delay surgery uh, uh, in order to get further investigations in order to diagnose them as a sleep, uh, sleep apnea or not. And uh, only we need to uh, do further investigations if there's a sign of symptoms of uh, cardiopulmonary compromise, as we said here, uh, like pulmonary hypertension or uh, oxygen uh, desaturation during the uh, unexplained oxygen desaturation during daytime. Uh, and whenever, uh, and she also recommended to use a CPAP machine or oxygen therapy for these patients whenever uh, you find any episode of. Uh, hypoventilation or obstructive uh, apneas or uh, desaturation in the, in the post-operative setting. Uh, and the second uh, one was in 2018, as you see here, uh, which was mainly for intraoperative management of patients uh, with uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And so they, as we mentioned before, they were recommending that you should expect a difficult airway in these patients and that you should try whenever it's possible to do uh, regional anesthesia instead of general anesthesia in these patients and uh, try as much as possible, be cautious with the intrathecal opioids. Uh, and if general anesthetic is to be done, you should try to use short acting agents minimize opioids as much as possible and try to use enhanced recovery principles by using short acting opioids and avoiding uh, basal rates on PCA pumps, consider multimodal analgesia and ensure full reversal of neuromuscular blockers and try to set the patient up during extubation and mobilize the patients early. And in the post-operative setting, uh, you should try as much as possible to set up the patient in bed uh, and position them laterally and try to be very cautious with opioids and uh, try to uh, do continuous monitoring for them with oximetry. And for sure, as we said before, uh, try to initiate the CPAP therapy as early as possible in the post-operative uh, period. Um, so, and at the end, also, I would like um, to invite anybody who's really interested to learn more about sleep medicine and anesthesia uh, to join us in our Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine virtual annual meeting next month. Uh, it would be really, uh, I would be really happy for sure to see, uh, to see you guys there. Uh, so, and thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, that was a very amazing and interesting lecture. Um, Thank you. Dr. We have uh, some questions for you here from the audience, uh, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. 
So starting uh, with the first question is, uh, can you please in brief elaborate the difference between pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic -pharm hypnosis in relation to normal sleep? If anything about this. Um, and uh, there's another question. What's about apnea, hypopnea index in children? Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll just say all the questions, probably you read it there, and then uh, it depends upon your time and your ability. I mean, uh, the time for the lecture as well. What's about apnea, uh, apnea hypopnea and index in children? Uh, how mm -hmm. to detect in the PACO cases of sleep apnea uh, who were not diagnosed in the preoperative uh, pre assessment? Um, do you, the, and the other question is, uh, do you recommend to use uh, preoperative CPAP in obstructive sleep apnea patients and in which patient? And uh, there's another question. So uh, starting with, with um, yeah, just uh, yeah, so questions for you, 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 you take over, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, yes, so uh, do you recommend the use of preoperative CPAP in OSA patient and in which, yeah, for sure, if, if we, uh, as I said before, uh, uh, as a society of anesthesia and sleep medicine recommended, it's really important to try to reuse a CPAP machine as much as possible for the OSA patient in the preoperative setting, uh, either the preoperative period or the period or the postoperative period. So what we do uh, is always we try to ask if a patient is on a CPAP therapy and a patient is coming for surgery, we always ask the patient to bring their own CPAP machine or we'll even try to, um, uh, to, get a, you know, like to, uh, so to get a CPAP machine ready for this patient if the patient is not able to bring his CPAP machine with him. And we should try to initiate CPAP therapy as much as possible in the pre-operative and post-operative period. It was also recommended by the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine if even the patients are not diagnosed uh, as, a C, uh, uh, as having CPAP, uh, sleep apnea, uh, that we should initiate CPAP therapy for them in the pre-operative or post-operative period if you find these patients are having uh, periods or are having events of obstructive sleep apnea or uh, uh, desaturation in the perioperative setting. Um, and also, so, so how do you detect cases of sleep apnea who were not diagnosed in the preoperative assessment in the PACU? Yeah, so usually it's, it's uh, by, uh, as, as I said before, if a patient is a high risk for sleep apnea, we should consider them as a by, by doing the stop bank, like we always try to do the stop bank, uh, stop bank questionnaire for any patient presenting to surgery to see if they are high risk for sleep apnea or not. And if the patient is a high risk for sleep apnea and they are not diagnosed with sleep apnea, we should consider them as a patient with a sleep apnea in the perioperative setting. So whenever we find these patients are having any uh, oxygen desaturation or any uh, 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 obstructive apnea events, we should not hesitate to uh, put them, uh, try to uh, afford them a CPAP machine and put them in a CPAP machine uh, on CPAP therapy in the perioperative period. And for sure to ask them to follow up with their primary care physician or family physician uh, to do a sleep study or to do further investigation to see if they are having sleep apnea or not. Uh, so is there any rule for new arousal improving after any, uh, yes, for sure. There's some, some evidence that said that, uh, patient, you know, with sleep apnea, sometimes they might, uh, for sure we use less opioids and less medications that can do more respiratory depression and also arousal improving medicines can be used for sure in those patients sometimes. Uh, and for stop bank questionnaire, yes, it, it correlates. So stop bank questionnaire is a problem about it. It's uh, um, highly sensitive, but it's not highly specific. So it can really, uh, uh, it has a high false positive as well, uh, but it also can correlate with OSA and can be used as a screening test for obstructive sleep apnea. But for sure, it's not the best or it's not the gold standard. Uh, for sure, the gold standard is to do um, the sleep, the in-lab sleep study, 
but as you know for sure that this might be uh, time consuming and more expensive uh, so what we usually do if if it's not gonna uh, delay uh, the surgery if 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 uh, if we still have time, we can do what we uh, like uh, the in as uh, sorry the portable sleep studies or the uh, one of the level four sleep studies, which is a home oximeter. Is trying just to get the patient a home oximeter so the patient would try to use it overnight and to see if this patient is really desaturating at home or not uh, before doing surgery for him. Uh, I hope I'm. What else? Uh, so yeah, apnea, hypopnea, and in children, it's the same, but usually the common cause of uh, sleep apnea in children's are, it's, it's usually related to craniofacial abnormalities or um, uh, due to uh, enlarged adenoids or tonsils uh, or some in some conditions, congenital problems. Uh, Difference between pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic hypnosis in relation to normal sleep. Uh, do you, uh, is that like uh, how how it's different, uh, like sleep with uh, anesthesia and uh, normal sleep? The difference is that what? I think uh, I think uh, that's fine. Uh, probably, if uh, uh, our colleague Mohammed Salman wants to elaborate about the uh, uh, question, or sorry, um, um, for the question you were mentioning, it's uh, yeah. If if our colleague wants to elaborate further about the uh, the details in the question, we is more than welcome. Um, thanks, uh, Mohammed, for uh, your time and effort. Uh, that was really amazing, and it's uh, a new branch of um, not not really new, but uh, it's new for many of yeah. us uh, to be uh, included in sleep medicine. And uh, we just see these patients, you know, coming for us. Uh, with, yeah. He's a complaining of obstructive sleep apnea, and he has a sleep study, but we don't have much details. And thank thank you very much for for all this information and. Uh, so uh, Dr. Last, uh, last question for me. Uh, you know, okay. all of us uh, doing night duties and uh, yes. <laughs> so what would the sleep medicine advice uh, uh, you know, the, the night duty people to do? Okay, I'll get a good try. sleep or is there any anything you would advise us with it? Yes, I'll try to share something with you as well, if you don't mind. I stopped sharing my uh, Screen right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you did, you did. which is good. You, yeah. you can share again. Okay, so yeah, for so also in 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 our in sleep medicine, we try to um, to do what we call physician wellness, uh, and uh, our main uh, for sure our main target is uh, the front frontline workers. Uh, for sure, and uh, people or physicians or uh, like nurses or healthcare workers who do the night shifts. Um, and I'll try to share something with you also for that. Uh, if not available, maybe we may take it another lecture, if you don't mind. Yeah, to I'll, allow I'll... Dr. Chris, you know, to, or maybe after Dr. Chris. Okay, okay, you got it. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so uh, that's uh, uh, like uh, it was uh, a, a study uh, published by uh, Dr. Mandeep Singh. He was trying to. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, giving some advice on physician wellness and how. So a way ways to prepare yourself for a good night's sleep. Um, 
try to exercise as much or help to maintain your sleep schedule. Uh, limit naps for sure. Limiting naps less than 20 minutes is very uh, helpful. Uh, and avoiding caffeine in the in, in afternoon. Um, as well as, as you see here, uh, before bed. And yeah, so signs for like, if you uh, try to uh, as much as possible, uh, look for uh, uh, some, you know, like some symptoms for uh, uh, sleep problems that can happen with you that uh, irritability, drowsiness, these are signs that need, uh, that means that you really need help. And uh, useful strategies like lifestyle modification, try to avoid over the counter sleeping pills. Uh, sometimes you can try to use melatonin uh, before going when you uh, come back from uh, your uh, uh, from sleep from your shifts, and also um, during your free time, trying to uh, practice and try to do some hobbies and try to get exposure to sunlight and exercise regularly, which would help you to improve your sleep health as well. Thank you very much for the advice, uh, Muhammad. No. That's uh, really great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we would like uh, to share all this in PDF later on, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh...